Well, great to see you all. I feel like this is Beeson's cooking show. <laughs> and I'm supposed to work up some kind of recipe for you um, with fear and trembling, um, which makes me think of uh, one of my grandsons when, and the mic is a little hot, but let me, I could probably talk easily without it, but um, OK, I'll use it. Uh, but Virginia was cooking with um, one of the young ones, and, uh, and he was helping out. And she said at one point, you're a real chef. And he looked at her and said, no, I'm a little boy with a mommy and a daddy. <laughs> so uh, that has absolutely nothing to do with Psalm 73. Psalm 73 is one of my favorite psalms, and I've preached it often because I think it speaks to the crisis of faith that is experienced in our culture. Uh, two books that, in thinking about just the uh, few moments at the beginning of this time, uh, in 2020, uh, Tim Patrick and Andrew Reid wrote a book on the whole counsel of God. And uh, Crossway published it, and it has a lot of good ideas in it. But one of the unique ideas in it is that it will take a pastor 35 years to preach through the whole Bible as they designed it. And at one point in the book, they say, of course this means that you have to be very careful in selecting your passage because you can only preach on it once in your 35 years. Well, I'm afraid that that rule has gone out the window for me um, on many texts, uh, because I think that there are key texts that are needed to be re-preached often. Uh, and then uh, just a comment from this book, which is a new one by Doug O'Donnell, and he's visited Beeson. He's a great guy, and he and Leland Riken an English professor sort of teamed up to talk about various genres and how to preach them. And he references twice a pastor who loves the Psalms but doesn't see himself preaching from a Psalm. So using the Psalm for spiritual formation, using the Psalm for uh, hospital visits, using the Psalm in a memorial service, but not actually preaching the psalm. And I would find my ministry greatly restricted if I did not preach the psalms. Uh, I think in some ways psalms are an anchor to not only the wisdom literature, but to the whole canon of scripture and are very valuable for that. Well, Psalm uh, 73, um, I'm going to read it. Uh, Listen carefully, this is God's word. If you've got Bibles, it'd be great to open up, but it's also on that outline that I gave you. So everybody, I hope, has one of those sheets, um, which I don't need to reference it again, but one sheet's a bibliography, and these are works that I have found really helpful. If you're real limited in what you want to get in the Psalms, Derek Kinder's little two-volume Inner varsity commentary on the Psalms is just really great. It's concise, it's helpful, it gives you your bearings in a Psalm. And of course, Alan Ross's volumes, three volumes on the Psalms, is great and uh, I think very expositionally helpful. And I'm not just saying that because Alan is a Beeson faculty member, but I am saying it because I was very dependent on Ross's expositional work. I've used all the sources that I list here. Um, when I was working on the Psalms uh, over the last five years or so, uh, I read Augustine on everyone, I read Calvin on everyone, Spurgeon on everyone, Ross on everyone, and you put all that together and it's just really helpful to understand. You're doing your due diligence in order to really understand the Psalm and then pastorally go from there. Psalm 73, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. 
I nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And then he goes on to describe, I'm not interrupting the text here. This is, what, this is not what I would do on a Sunday in worship. But note the first line and how easy that flows from our lips. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. I'd love to know the tone as Asaph is giving this. You know, Asaph was a worship leader during Solomon and David's time. And then his sons followed in his tradition. He wrote 15 psalms, Psalm 50 and then Psalm 73 on for uh, 14 psalms. And there's a kind of quality to those particular 15 psalms that are somewhat cutting and prophetic. He tends to have a sharp edge to him. And uh, interesting that the worship leader would sound like a prophet. And uh, this psalm, of course, uh, is an indication of that. Put in contrast the cliche, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped, for I envied the arrogant because of the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles, verse 4. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. When I preached on this a few weeks ago at the Church of the Cross, this new EPC church plant, I struggled with a, a way to enter into the sermon, um, partly because it's familiar with, to me. I've loved the idea of the crisis and the resolution of the crisis. And I picked up on that, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped, I, for I envied the arrogant. And I thought, you know, there is a uh, hurting kind of envy. And we hear a lot these days, I think, about people that are struggling with their, their experience in the church. And what Asaph is experiencing here is a kind of hurting envy, an envy that he doesn't really want to have. Um, and it's thrust upon him, and he's reacting to it. And what he's reacting to is not the ugly side of evil, but the beautiful side of evil. Uh, he's not looking at the criminal and the thief and the pimp and the prostitute. He's looking at the athletic, the intelligent, the photogenic, the powerful, who could give a rip about God. And here he is called, ordained, designated to lead the people in worship. And he's not looking at Canaanites. He's looking at Israelites. He's looking at the people that he is endeavoring to lead in worship. And he feels deeply the angst of that. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And I kept thinking about, well, and this, this is how this thought came to me. This is not what I would preach. The thought came to me that every time I have preached on Proverbs 31, I get pushback from women who feel inferior and insecure to the model of the woman that's described at the end of Proverbs 31. Can you identify with that? Realize that I might get that? Maybe that's how I preach it. I don't know. Maybe that's where the problem is. But uh, I find that that woman 
bringing conclusion to the Proverbs is a wonderful example. A wonderful, I mean, you want to emulate that. That God-centeredness in a life that's full and whole and confident and courageous laughs. You know, I mean, I think it's a wonderful picture. So I think there is a hurting kind of envy and a healing kind of envy, a healthy kind of envy. When Paul says, I resolve to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, I guess I want to envy that. I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I envy that. I want to say that too. And so this, that's how I got into this sermon two weeks ago, a hurting kind of envy that is destructive and a healing, healthy kind of envy that calls us up. Um, I mean, there's a lot of tremendous I statements from Paul that I think are just so, you know, I am who I am because of the grace of Christ. That I envy. So that's how I began, and then we looked at the beautiful side of evil and that description from uh, two on. Um, and the reason I call it an arc of devotion is because I kind of see this process, which may be kind of an essential process in every Christian's life, where you have the simple statement, the simple religious statement, almost a cliche, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, easy to say. Oliver Wendell Holmes, you know that, that saying you've heard many times before that um, the difference between the simplicity on this side of complexity and the simplicity on the other side of complexity. I won't give, my, I won't give a fig for simplicity on this side of complexity, but I'll give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. And that's part of the dynamic, I think, of one's working through here in Psalm 73. You know, a lot could be spent in preaching on this description of the beautiful side of evil. And we don't spend a lot of time in the church on that side of evil. And yet, that is the side that we kind of experience. And I, you know, my mind begins to think, because there's a, one of the things that I think is profound about the Psalms is that they're not randomly placed. Psalm 72 is all about what the king should be. It's a beautiful, powerful poem about what a God-centered king should be like. And it's so good, the description, that one thinks of the king of kings and lord of lords. And then you get Psalm 73. And then Psalm 74 is about when Babylon destroys Jerusalem takes it down to the ground, burns everything up, rage against worship. And in a way, that sequence is significant, I think. The king, tremendous disappointment in 73, and this led to God's judgment of Jerusalem and Judah. Well, that's a little bit beyond what I would do in a sermon. Um, but it'd be great for the discussion after the sermon. Um, this is speculative on my part, but who might have been in the congregation that disturbed Asaph so? That he found it contradictory to be trying to lead in worship with these people or this person there. And I guess the person that comes to mind is Solomon. With his 1,000 wives and concubines, with his uh, zoo, with his uh, uh, idols and shrines built to Moloch and Asherah, and this, this man who obviously took great pride in the pluralism that he was sponsoring. 
and the tolerance that he was officially presiding over. And Asaph's looking at a, what a difference between David's worship and Solomon's worship. David, yeah, being a, a broken man who, in a sense, set in motion a lot of what Solomon lived into. Nevertheless, uh, Solomon may have been in that congregation, causing a lot of pain and angst for Asaph. In the Ark of Devotion, you start up here kind of with the cliche, and then you dip down into the envy and the struggle and the angst. And I think verse 13 probably hits bottom. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. I wonder how many teenagers think that way, who are trying to follow Christ in a highly hyper, either secular or nominally Christian environment where there is not much authenticity. How have we ever kind of hit that point? Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. In vain I've washed my hands in innocence. So I think that's the bottom. And more time could be spent, for sure, developing that understanding of really part of the authenticity of the Christian hitting bottom and being honest and acknowledging that. And then I see the ark moving up. And it's interesting what the first line of defense is for Asaph. In verse 15, if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to, I mean, that line, or, or betrayed this generation of your people, if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. What is the first thing that keeps him? Others. Other God fears. The people of God. His family that he would have let down. Now, that's not going to be sufficient. And that's not going to last. But that's the first line of defense which says a lot about us in our isolated individualism and our autonomous individualism and all of that because uh, we're not really oftentimes very well connected. So there is nobody. We might feel to ourselves that there is nobody I'm letting down. That's a really dangerous thought. Maybe that's why Hebrews 10 is so important. Let us draw near. Let us not give up worshiping together. Let us not. Um, but let us draw near to God. All day long I've been afflicted. Every morning brings new punishments. In verse 15, if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Now, I think the New Testament equivalent for entering the sanctuary of God here is really understanding what the cross is all about. In worship, in the gospel, confronting what the meaning of the Christian life is. That Christ died for us in the midst of both the ugly side of evil and the beautiful side of evil. And that we ourselves are caught up in that evil. Till I entered the sanctuary of God and then I understood their final destiny. The, what he saw was now assessed by invisible truths. The invisible truths of God's will, God's word. This is where you might say I resolved to know nothing when I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's in this context, this cruciform situation that uh, Asaph 
experiences why these sacrifices that he officiates are important. And this is his assessment now, coming out of that experience of worship. Surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They're like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Who does that remind you of? that language. Sorry. It reminds me of Job. He's not, I can see where you, where you might choose Nebuchadnezzar. But there's a sense here in which Asaph isn't feeling judged by God or assessed as being wrong before God. But he was ignorant. And there's no indication here that he gave in to the envy. No in, in, uh, indication that he is part of the problem as much as the fact that I didn't understand. I didn't grasp. I didn't appropriate and uh, embrace the, the significance of surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Verse 23, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. I think there's New Testament equivalents, like the Galatians 2 text, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Isn't that a New Testament equivalent to what he's expressing here? Or Psalm 27, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. The theme of judgment comes in, but it's in the context of the gospel of God's grace expressed in 23 and following. Now we come to another point. How did this begin? But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. And then verse 28, but as for me, it's good to be near God. See, there's a difference between the surely God is good to Israel, but as for me, to this, but as for me, it's good to be near God. This is the simplicity on the other side of complexity. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell of not my deeds, but your deeds. So that's the arc of devotion as I see it, uh, a text that probably does a pretty good job of preaching itself, if you follow the train uh, of thought. Comments, questions? Got a few minutes before one, and well, I'll begin if I may. Um, I appreciate the way in which you, from the Old Testament to, to the New, from the Psalmist to Christ. Would you talk a little bit about how you make those judgments? You know, I would say that I've preached this psalm um, quite a few times without the. Uh, definite Christological emphasis. Um, it's always been there in some form, but now I guess I'm more confident in bringing it out at the beginning and the end. You know, the, the healthy envy of, I want to be like the person who says, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So, I mean, that's been sort of a, a d developing, maturing process over time, a comfort with uh, you know, I believe the Psalms are Jesus' songbook, prayer book. He prayed these Psalms. Uh, they're all messianic from my standpoint. Not only the explicit prophecy ones, but they all describe his life. Um, and, you know, when he talks, uh, when Hebrews talks about he learned obedience by the things that he suffered, certainly he was impressed with the beautiful side of evil, not as a temptation necessarily, but as a threat to the worship life of the people of God. 
Thank you. I would say that the early church theologians free you up. I agree. <laughs> because, uh, you know, our historical grammatical method basically says work through the psalm, and then at the end, bring in Jesus. But I think the early church fathers, they start with Jesus, they move with Jesus, they end with Jesus. And the psalmist is, um, you know, yep. it's a Christian. Every, you know, I, I, Dale Bruner says, every text in the Old Testament and New Testament has to kneel before the Christ. Amen. So. Thank you, Dr. Webster. Um, I'm interested uh, if you would say a little bit more about the transition that happens in the arc of devotion. So I'm thinking especially um, of verse 17, until I entered the sanctuary of God. And when that shift happens from the movement down to the movement up, could you say more about how you see that in the Christian life um, as you make that Christological connection with that point of the arc? Yeah. One of the things I say in conclusion was you have to ask yourself, we have to ask ourselves, where we are on this arc. Are we at verse 1? And I know, I, I know a lot of Beeson students describe the, the 1-1 relation, the, the reality and having moved from that sort of cliched religion where it's not their own, it hasn't been embraced. It's words. Surely God is good to Israel. And then the throes of being caught up in um, the envy that comes that's somewhat debilitating and discouraging and deconstructive of seeing what life could be like apart from that and experiencing it, only to find its emptiness. And then understanding what it is to uh, to live into the theology, into the salvation, into the gospel that's proclaimed in God's word and in his church, and realizing a completely different understanding of their early years in religion, Christianity, Christendom. Uh, what Asaph definitely says you know, until I entered the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their destiny. There's so much behind that uh, to grasp, to understand, to appreciate, to rejoice in. Uh, John? On the Ark of Devotion, is this only for this psalm, simplicity to complexity to simplicity, or is that a general theme you see? Hmm. You know, I'd, I'd say it applies to this particular psalm. You're okay. going to see other dynamics in other psalms. Mm. Um, it's not that I would say it's only here where the psalmist uh, begins at a point that um, is untested, mm. only to experience testing. Yeah. Could I ask a follow-up question then? Sure. So do you feel like there's been a transition where maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you would have had a pro like a you would have had a challenge preaching, bringing someone to this point of complexity, whereas now maybe, like, is there more difficulty in bringing someone to resolution, like bringing someone out of a complexity that they might desire to stay in a state of? That's a, I mean, that's a good question. I, I don't, uh, having preached it 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, this is a human condition mm -hmm. issue. So in some ways, the ways that you might feel generationally that this is unique, it, um, it, it's not so unique. Mm -hmm. It's part, of, part in, of the dilemma of humanity. I mean, it was in his time, and it has maintained that way. Is it harder? Um, is the envy stronger? Uh, is it more difficult till I entered the sanctuary of God and then I understood their final destiny? Is, is that a more difficult place? To be, it is more difficult, I would say, in the lack of fellowship, the lack of, and so often 
in your stories, because I hear your stories and your reflection papers in pastoral theology, oftentimes it is a key person who shows love and compassion and models the Christian life that is the turnaround figure. So, I mean, this, I, I think this is really important. And, and, and again, in a sermon, this is something that could be commended. The values that you hold in people's lives, if you're just authentically Christian, real Christian, Christ uh, indwelling Christian. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you've preached this psalm several times. What is your process for approaching a text that you've already preached before, and is it different from the first time you preach it? Yeah, it's um, it's always really new. Um, yeah, I don't know. Virginia, would you have a comment on that? Well, the text speaks for itself with, with the angst and the envy and uh, figuring out how to enter into the sanctuary. So regardless of 30 years ago mm -hmm. or now, those problems are still the same. Do you, you start preaching into it, you're getting into the text, but you've still got the same thing theologically that you're dealing with. I didn't think you answered. Is that Scott? Over there? No. The first guy who spoke? Christopher? Oh, I didn't think you answered this question very well. Did you think you did? <laughs> 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 He's happy. He's happy. I'm happy. You see what I get at home? <laughs> what it means to sit in the sanctuary under the Lord. What uh, spiritual uh, practices did Asa go through to kind of get turned around? Is that Was that your question? Yeah. Uh-oh. Okay, just I, forget I said Yes, it. well, I think there's, yeah, I would also be interested in the pastoral aspect of how, how do you walk with someone to the, the point of receiving that, that fresh grace in which they're they're really going to feel in the sanctuary that that simplicity kind of comes together. The question does raise a really, I think, important observation, so I'm glad you've come back to it. Um, <laughs> is the, the timeline of this arc we don't know? Was it a couple of years? You know, how long was the anxiety of envying the arrogant because I saw the prosperity of the wicked. That could be a long time. And we've known people where it's gone for decades. And then the transition, which he says in a verse or two, could be a long process uh, of struggle and prayer and uh, realizing the value of the gospel that he thought he knew, but now understands in a deeper way. So I'm glad you brought that up, the timeline as such. Um, and uh, Michael, I really find uh, the Psalms always fresh, you know. I think it'd be interesting if you could do it for 10 weeks in a row, the same Psalm, if it get old. I don't know with me if it would, <laughs> because I, uh, I think it's a powerful truth. You're living into it. That, that makes sense. I think my question was more, like, do you... Do you start from the same place? Like, oh, yeah. Do you look at your old notes? Do you look at your old sermon? Or do you just consider, yeah, do you do you start fresh every time in that way? Not, I mean, I understand that. That's a good, that's a good point. Does that point. make sense? Yeah. It does. Process, I, yeah. Envy was new on this. And I don't even know, because I've never talked about a good kind of envy. <laughs> envy is just bad. Um, so to think of a hurting envy and a healthy envy, uh, was was a new thought that came. Uh, I really think Joel Brooks gets a lot of great insights into the word. And Joel would emphasize the fact that um, you need space with the word. Okay, this is your text. And you're just going to spend a lot of time, a lot of time thinking about it. I mean, I really like reading commentaries. I don't have any order so sometimes to get me kind of energized for a text, I read the commentaries. And uh, you know, of course I'm reading and reading and praying the text, but uh, 
you can go, f- you know, it's not sermon prep time. It's life. So you're going for a walk, and all you're thinking about is that text. How do I bring this out? And it's, it's become, it becomes just so much a part of who you are that you're not on the clock. You know, my whole family would, uh, would kind of know this text before it was preached and hear every thought, and uh, they were always really good sports about it. My middle son, on Thursday, I would give the sermon to sometimes, not all the time, with $5 <laughs> and a red pen and tell him, circle everything that's confusing. Um, and he enjoyed doing that to his dad. <laughs> Dr. Weston, um, I really need to be mindful of time here. Uh, I'm curious, have you ever preached it from an ecclesiological perspective? Not the individual, but the people as a whole in this ark? Well, just in, uh, in identifying Solomon as the potential problem and the Israelites, and then you've got Psalm 74 that talks about God judging Israel through the Babylonians. Well, that's a judgment on the whole society. 72 is what the king needs to be and is not in Israel. 73 is giving us a hint as to how one of the worship leaders assessed that and diagnosed it. And then 74 is talking, God just judges the people. So that's that's a broader church kind of perspective, I guess. Eli. Uh, I'm struck by when I read this um, what it says about God's character that he would give us these words where sometimes disobeying him mm-hmm. looks attractive. Uh, do you, would you try to bring that out or encourage people to reflect on that? Or? Oh, I love the honesty of the Psalms. There's a lot of go to hell stuff in the Psalms and God can take it. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's to whom we vent. And God can take it, invites it. The best thing you can do with hate and rage and frustration and anxiety is to pray it out to God. And this is the value of the Psalms. It gives us the words. We've got the feelings. (laughs) Now in the Psalms, we've got the words. And that's invaluable to us. Yeah. Well, let's pray. Lord God, thanks for this opportunity with sisters and brothers in Christ to look at this particular psalm. Please apply your truth, your gospel to our lives in ways that uh, we can embrace, take to heart, live into. Thank you, Lord, for what you've called us to do. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen.